Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Healing Ties 2.0, featured on the Whole Care Network and on UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio. I'm your host and presenter, Christopher McClellan. You just might know me as the Bowtie Guy. On this episode, we visit with author and bedside singer, Reverend Linda Bryce. Through her marvelous book, The Courage to Care, Being Fully Present with the Dying, Linda's mission is to pass on her understanding and show you how to be there at the bedside, fully present with anyone who is dying, and sharing in the mystery and wonders of death and after. And I know you're going to enjoy learning about the bedside singers, too. Let's enjoy my conversation with Linda, and we'll see you on the other side of the show. Well, greetings, Linda, and welcome to this episode of Healing Ties 2.0. It is great to visit with you today. Thank you, Chris. It's a joy for me to be here. No, I just, we, we have some connections that uh, are of friends, and now we get the opportunity to chat, and I already know we have synergy, but what our listeners don't know is how are you creating healing ties? So if, if I say this in a shortened way, I'd say by being a compassionate companion on someone else's journey. It's something we can all do and be. And that's by being at the bedside and it's by singing at the bedside. So those are those are the two the two main messages I was hoping to impart through my book. Yeah, compassionate companion. I've done probably 300 healing ties podcast over the years. And I have never heard that uh those two words put together. How beautiful. Compassionate companion. This is this is someone else's journey. The companion part of this. This is someone else's journey. We're not there to fix. We're not there to solve. We're there to, Ram Dass said, we're walking each other home. And I remember writing a sentence, something like, our burdens are made easier when someone is with us. Yeah. Now, what kind of a companion are you, though? Well, there, that, that, that's the okay, sixty-four so that's million the, dollar that's question. Where, right, that's, that's where right. the compassionate part comes in. Right. Are you someone who hmm, is there, but is there perhaps physically? I mean, mm-hmm. you are physically in the space, right? But you're not really with that person, or you resent being there. I've sung it at bedsides and visited at bedsides where there is sometimes family present, for example. And the family is talking about who's going to get mom's boat when she dies. (laughs) They're sitting there checking their phone the whole time. The compassionate part is what are we doing? What are we doing internally? You know, what is our intention? What, What are we sending out? energetically, what are we exuding in that space? You know, when you go into a room, you feel what's been going on in the room. Is this a happy place? Is this a down place? Is this an angry place? Atmosphere does play a part in all of this. Somewhere along the line, I found Rumi. Rumi, a 13th century Persian poet and a Sufi mystic, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a part of one of his writings, he said, the only seeds we should plant are love and compassion. So true. And so inside of me, so so stepping back, before I visit someone, I prepare myself. And there's one particular song I sing to myself, and it's called Open My Heart. Open My Heart Heart. Let holy love flow through me. That's all I want, coming from me to be received by the one in the bed. It's all about positive energy. And accepting them as they are, as they are now. When I tell people what I do, the most often response is, 
oh, I could never do that. Or I wasn't going to visit someone because I wanted to remember them as they were. Right. Isn't this the same person that you supposedly loved? Why wouldn't you continue to be with them, mm -hmm. regardless of how they outwardly may appear at this point? Right. You know, if you read the literature, and over the last six years, I've read so many books on... <laughs> by others who have done this work or who have been ill themselves and who have spoken to others, as well as, you know, the classics by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and, and other right. people like her and, and Atul Gawande more, more recently with yeah. Being Mortal and, and so Fabulous. forth and so on. Yeah. There's a universal, I would call it lament that goes through all of that. Our individuals who feel isolated, who feel abandoned. Yeah. They want a companion on right. their journey, you know? And, and whether that's in the home or in a facility, and I'd suggest even more so in a facility. So most of my visits have been to nursing homes and long-term care facilities. Putting the best face on that situation. Nevertheless, there is never enough time for staff to be spending time with the people who are living there. Right. The personal, I, I mean, in addition to the whole, I'm sick and I don't have freedom of movement anymore and <laughs> my life is run right. in this little half of a room mm -hmm. by the schedule of the facility and they come and see me when they have to do something to me, but not to have time to say, oh, and what did you do with your life? You know, what, what, what did you, what were, what were your favorite moments? You, right. What, who are you? Share your story. Those kind of healing ties are missing exactly. too often. I know you know this, Linda, there's, there's no greater honor bestowed on us and to be present to another person at the time when life transitions. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. For some people it's hard to, to be in that position. Not everybody can do it, but we all have the capacity to have the compassion if we're, real, if we're comfortable to, enough to step outside of our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Yes. To think about the one in the bed. Think about the one in the bed, right? Not, 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 no, no focus on us. The focus and the intention is to one in the bed. I'm also, I'm also a hospice vigil volunteer, which means I can be called in to sit vigil when someone is very close. Right. And on occasion, that has been someone whom I had not visited before or to whom I had not sung before. And I find your comment, you know, and the way this exchange has, has unfolded is that in those situations, I'm, I find myself speaking to that person. Who are you? Right. I wish I knew who you were, right. you know, and I wonder if you did such and such. Mm -hmm. And I can't know what you're inner journey is right at this moment, but I'm here for you. And the comfort that that transmits to the person in the bed, while can't describe it personally, because I have not, ex I have not been in that position. I think I know cognitively how I would feel. And that would be a feeling of joy, happiness, that somebody is there with me participating in this transition. That is the message I took away from Gawande's book, this no one alone. Right. And it came to me as I finished his book and my being a threshold choir singer or a bedside singer, we have mm. different monikers for this. Right. Mm -hmm. Is a companion initiative, no one without song. No one without song. Yeah. That is... <laughs> and so that's, this is, this is my, this is my latest push thrust 
I want to spread the word about the power of song at the bedside and to encourage those for whom this fits mm -hmm. um, to think about beginning or joining uh, groups who sing, who can be at the bedside. And, and I would say it's not always on the deathbed, right? That's, right. that's one thing I, I address early on in my book is what I ask the question, what image came to your mind when I mentioned the word dying? And I say probably it's what we most often call on your deathbed. We nevertheless visit individuals who are much earlier in their journey. Right. You know, if they if, if if they if they want a visitor or if they want singing um, for comfort, for reassurance, for consolation, we're there. They may still be ambulatory and alert. And I walked in on this one um, one woman in in a state south of us. And I often go alone first to meet the person and to explore the space and the facility and the individuals and so forth. And we're having this wonderful conversation. It probably helps that I've been described as someone who can talk to a post. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and out of nowhere, she says, I'm dying and I'm okay with that I said okay fine and we went on with our conversation so you know we we sang to her off and on for probably six months it isn't only during the last weeks or days right right and you said something that just really uh hit home with me uh, and I'm going to have to paraphrase this here uh, knowing having a plan what would you like to what would you like would you like to have singing would you like it, it, there's it, I feel privileged to not only have this conversation with you but all the, the, the caregivers that I've talked to over the years since Richard made his life transition mm -hmm. and what's a What's common across the board is that these conversations uh, about transitions don't often happen unless until we're kind of like right in the middle of it and people just don't know what their loved one, care partner, whatever word you want to use, what their desires are. And you know the message we try to employ in part on people is that if you just have this find a way to have this conversation as early on as possible it makes a difficult situation just a tad bit easier for everybody involved mm -hmm. yes since doing this work more recently over the last mm, probably only the last year or so I've learned about another organization called The Conversation Project. Their mission is to get people having conversations about their end of life wishes. And so I'm now what's called a champion, quote unquote, with them, giving presentations on how you might begin conversations. Mm. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And you're right. How, how do we know what someone wants? Unless, uh, unless we've, we've talked about it. Uh, how do you know, you know, you're just kind of, you're just kind of getting you're at you're at this. I was going to use the word critical, but I'm going to say I'm going to you change that I'm gonna say you're at this important stage in life 
And you want to give that person exactly what they want, but you don't know. Mm -hmm. And this is, and I guess that's kind of why I stay in this and I get the opportunity to talk to awesome people like you is, is we get to share these messages and hope that it touches somebody so they, so that on their journey, uh, they have, I'm going to just going to use, I'm going to been, been waiting for the right spot. They have the courage to care, to be fully present with the dying. Mm -hmm. And you've captured it so well in your book and especially in the title. Being Thank fully you. present, mm -hmm. yeah. and, I, and I'm not. You know, I, I obviously I don't, don't not not in a Pollyanna world. It's not not everybody can do this. It's not, uh, but it's important to recognize where what your comfort zone is, so that again you can make plans. I'm just I don't know. That's why we connect so well. It's. it's <laughs> <laughs> But let's talk a little bit about your book. Tell us, uh, tell our listeners about your book, the title. I know it just kind of encompasses your work, but uh, it's always good to hear it right from the author. Ah. Yes. So The Courage to Care, Being Fully Present with the Dying. To care about all of life, all of life. And the courageous part of that is all of life, which also encompasses the end of life. Um, you mentioned stepping out of your comfort zone. Right? If we haven't ever, and this this is this is also a function of our culture, mm -hmm. which I'd suggest is beginning to change a bit. Uh, COVID has definitely changed the, that, that, yeah. Um, that and over the last 50 years with hospice being introduced here in the U.S. and then palliative care um, and more recently the home funerals and green burials. I mean, there seems, you know, there seems to be this gradual shift that in these other ways we're beginning to address how we personally just because we're a friend just because we're a neighbor just because we're a family member we don't need any credentials after our name right that's not to say that training um, and study doesn't open up and introduce you to more you know in in olden times you grew up with death in the home the extended family you were taking care of each other the elders became sick you nursed them they died at home you saw them to their last breaths you perhaps honored them with the sacred washing of the body with getting them ready for burial and you carried them out. We don't grow up anymore with that tie right. to all of that. Mm -hmm. And so I'd suggest that the courage comes from going past your feeling uncomfortable. Right. And aren't we always uncomfortable? And maybe not always, most often uncomfortable when yeah. we're engaging or about to engage in something for the first time. Right. Because you don't, you know, you don't know what, you know, it's, it's like, you know, and, and even in my book, I say this is, this is to, to help prepare you to know what to expect. These are options. These, these, these are um, ways that you can be a compassionate companion mm -hmm. and, and have a, a healing connection with this person. Um, and, and I cannot give you the experience you 
have you have, to go. You have to you go. You just have to go. Well, it, I, I'll just use a Nike for you. Just do it. So that, You know, I say that in the book, too. <laughs> I know. <laughs> just do it. Just, uh. just have to do it. <laughs> and, and, I would, I would, and I would suggest that when you just do it, you realize that all of those imaginary fears that you had built right. up and built up and imaginary built up fears, were, right. just <laughs> were just that. We're just that. We're just that. Imaginary fears. I, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, Linda, why, you know, you know cultures obviously are different uh, across, yes. across the globe, but I, I, I wonder why in our Western culture, because I've had the opportunity to talk to folks in the Mideast and, now, you know, I just feel blessed that I've had this opportunity to talk for people that have different viewpoints on this and and are comfortably present. But it just seems like in our Western culture as a whole that this is like almost like a taboo subject that we sweep under the carpet. And we don't deal with it until we're right in the middle of it. I just have never, never understood why it's so hard for us in, uh, in the West to... To have these open conversations about something that's an important part of life. That is a part of life, right? <laughs> there's no one answer why. Mm -hmm. There's no right. one there, answer. Yeah. yeah, there's, there's no, no one, one answer. answer. The way we live today is different. Our families aren't together. We travel to where we need to to earn a living we're focused on that we're focused on the living part we have more emphasis on youth and and the burdensome caring mm -hmm. of those who are aging and ill we have amazing medical developments right which some of us cling to to the absolute last breath because why because we want to extend life life we need to be here um and that has created its own challenges that's a whole that that, that is another, a whole business industry in and of itself and another reason why conversations need to happen before someone is in icu before someone is in an emergency situation. Oh, you know, yeah. I... What is important to you? When I when I do those when I do those talks for the conversation project, the question is, what matters most to you? So what kind of activities are a part of your daily life? What does a mm -hmm. good day look like for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and once you, you begin to think about that. So the first conversation is, I, we're kind of going off the book and yet we're not exactly, but the first conversation is with yourself, is with myself. Mm -hmm. What do I want? Why is that important? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all of those forms that we have now right and we lived we i certainly lived through that i remember being in law school when it was the karen quinlan and uh, the, yeah. karen and quinlan and terry shivo and the battles this is another reason why you need to have conversations because Exi family members disagree please family members and sometimes vehemently and if you have one person saying i want to do this for dad and you have the other person saying no i want to do this for dad you're wrong who's who's lost in all of this dad and what dad wants <laughs> that's right because you know, uh, as i've as i've learned over the years i uh, and uh, where there's a will there's a family member oh <laughs> 
haven't heard that. <laughs> but the, wow. it, you know, it, so so it is so important to have those conversations before. And there's so many people. They're, they're having these conversations in the back of an ambulance on the way to the hospital oh. mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of an emergency. And and what happens when that is going on? Uh, uh, emotions take over and yes. you're not thinking straight. And you're just, it's just, uh, it's why it's just, uh, maybe I'm the weird one. I just love having these conversations because they're real life and they help families in the midst of a crisis, allow them to focus on the person who is in need of the care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and without that, it turns it like you just mentioned, it turns it, it, the, the questions are turned around. You know, one sibling wants this, the other sibling wants that, and they forget about, well, wait a minute, what does the, what did mom or dad want? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't, yeah, so. Which is also why it's important to either write it down or something I've heard recently, of course, with, with our phones these days, those folks who have smartphones with the cameras built in and, mm -hmm. and, their, and also video and audio recordings is have that going when you're speaking with someone so that it is written down not on paper, but it is recorded in a video or on an audio track. Oh, now there's new information. That is a great idea. Yes. Wow. See, well, you have so much background in, in law and multi multitask. <laughs> and I love to sing. And music music has always been a part and my children would say ma um cuz I'm a lyric person mhm mm if i can't understand the lyrics the song is i'm not interested no. <laughs> <laughs> i want to hear what the lyric is yeah cuz the the it, and, it, Music does have a way of touching us. and Oh, yes. You know, at one point I thought of writing a book just on music. Music and healing. Mm. But there's... That, that could be... I know, that's, that's... But there is a, a chapter entirely devoted to music. And for readers who aren't aware a summary list of what science and research has shown how music benefits each of us mm -hmm. in our physical bodies and with our emotions and certainly with our spirits. You know, so bringing music, um, music creates healing ties. Music creates healing ties. And I think this is a great spot where we can take our break and if we come back from the break two things i'm gonna like i do i'm gonna put you on the spot and ask you about one fun fact about you and then on the set after that we can really dive into uh the music aspect and the bedside singers because i i just think that is uh, i have some stories to share about that with you also but i just uh, uh, I'm just excited about uh, what's going to come up in the second half. So that sounds you're great. You're listening to Healing Ties featured on the Whole Care Network and on UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio. We'll be right back. Hey, it's uh, Christopher McClellan. You just might know me as the Bowtie Guy on Healing Ties 2.0. On Healing Ties, we visit with people from all over the globe who share their stories because it's through story sharing where diversity meets the road to collaborate in a common cause. And if you'd like to share your story on Healing Ties, email me direct at thebowtieguy at healingties.com. We would love to share your story 
happiness and prosperity. Well, welcome back, everybody. We are continuing our delightful conversation with author Linda Price. And Linda, I'm sorry I have to tell you this, but you're on the spot. This is the time where everybody's on the edge of their seats, wanting to know that one fun fact about you that uh, will be etched in their memory as they, le- as they listen to this episode of Healing Tie. So the microphone is all yours. I settled on something that has nothing to do with death and dying, and I will shorten the story. Before children, my late husband and I used to go canoeing in the boundary waters of northern Minnesota. And on one of those trips, we are gliding across this glassy long lake, and on the right side was this tall rock cliff. And as we enter that part of the lake, I see a bird take off from the top of this cliff. And he's flying around. And then he's heading straight for me in the canoe. So without thinking, I stand up in the canoe. I put my paddle up into the air. I'm waving the paddle back and forth. (laughs) And my husband says, Linda, sit down. You're rocking the canoe. (laughs) Uh, I sat down. The bird went over us. Uh, Fortunately, it's... (laughs) um, He missed us and uh, let go in the water near the canoe uh, Mm -hmm. and went back up to the top of the cliff. Oh, you, you know, Linda, I think there's a title of the song there, R- Rocking the Canoe. Oh. <laughs> I, 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 I think we could work on the lyrics together on that. I think there, I, I think well, there, I. Is it, well, isn't there a song, Rock the Boat, Don't Rock the Boat, Don't Rock baby. the Boat, Baby, Rock the yeah. Boat. Oh, God, I'm going to be, I'm going to be canceled <laughs> after singing on my own podcast. But, <laughs> but no, think about it. Rock, rock, rock the Canoe by Linda Bryce. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just got this vision in my mind, so I got to get back. This is great. Well, that was a great one. Thank you for sharing that. And it just kind of leads us into what we want to talk about in the second segment: is bedside singers and music. Um, I, I, let me just kind of share this thought with you. And I'm not sure if we talked about this before, and I know my listeners have heard this, but um, I need to just say this. <laughs> because it's one of the most amazing experiences I had when I was doing clinical pastoral education, uh, CPE, 20 years ago. Goodness, <laughs> my hair was on the top of my head, not on my <laughs> not on my face then. But uh, um, well, the story in the, in, in the hospice was uh, uh, lazy. She was in her 90s, and she had not, um, she had not, um, uh, I don't know really what the right term was, but she hadn't been responsive for a couple of days and, and communicating with her, her family. And then uh, a music therapist came in. And the music therapist, uh, was a guitar, uh, started playing tunes from her era. And, and after a while... Uh, the woman started to hum and then she became responsive and she started singing some of the tunes and she was uh, present with her family for a couple of days before she made her transition and that that power you know i i learned from that that experience uh what the power of music was I've always 
wish I was a better musician, but I, I think it's a, it's another example about something that we don't really know about until we experience it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why when, when I read, read about you and the work that you're doing and this bedside singers, it's like, that, there's, that just touches my heart. And I'd really love you to love for you to talk in depth about the bedside singers and how that came about. I'm sure that there are singers and musicians who are not part of any organized group and yet do what we do. I lead the Berkshire Threshold Choir, which is a local chapter of the national group Threshold Choir International, founded now about 21 years ago in California by a woman who was sitting at the bedside of her dying friend who's dying of HIV AIDS. And she said, I was scared. I didn't know what to do. What can I do for this person? And she found herself beginning to sing. And for the next two hours, she sang. From that experience, she was the founder of Threshold Choir. When I was with my aunt, who was dying, I went up to Maine. I'm close to that family and those cousins. They were not surprised when I just said, I'm coming. <laughs> Did not ask for an invitation. I'm coming. And I was up there for about the last 10 days. And on the night before Aunt Lee would, would pass, for me too, never having heard of bedside singing, it was a natural impulse for me to begin singing. Singing songs from her tradition, singing songs mm -hmm. that I knew. What you describe as well is music particularly music from someone's generation that they've grown up with, that's in their right. long-term memory. Did mm -hmm. you know music, music is anchored to more places in our brain than mm -hmm. anything else? Uh, there's a movie, Alive Inside, which outlines not bedside singing, but the power of music, particularly with individuals um, with dementia. That music, oh, yeah. that music still gets through. Like you were saying, music gets through. Mm -hmm. So we're called a choir, threshold choir. That does not mean that there is an entire choir that comes to your bedside. You know, when we are invited, we go into the home. All of us in these days, all of us are vaccinated. All of us are following the protocols. We can go into the home or when the facilities are open. And right now, <clears throat> we're not singing in facilities uh, where I am in Massachusetts uh, because, because of their safety measures and protocols. Um, but we visit. And we and and so as a bedside singer, you are both sides of this courage to care being fully present. Mm -hmm. You're there as a visitor, and you're able and, and as a compassionate companion, and you're bringing song. Uh, it's it's just an an amazing intersection of both of those. Um, we can see, we sing a cappella. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that. And there are at least two who go so we can do harmony. Mm -hmm. Actually, yesterday I had a rehearsal here for our group at my home. And about, oh, I think last month there was an article in the paper about us. And so we've been, I've been receiving inquiries 
and we have several new members. It gave everyone chills to be able to be together, singing through masks, social distance and all that, but right. being together rehearsing in three-part harmony. And the newest member said, oh, are you the group that recorded that CD? It sounds just like them. I said, no, actually not, but um, so, when we begin singing, we can see the change in people. Right. We can see how, how, how they become calm, how they're not anxious anymore, how their restlessness and their darting is around is, is settling in. Their, their breathing becomes more regular. Um, those who haven't been able to rest, to sleep, do that. Because we say to them, we say to them, you know, this is our gift to you. We're here to sing to you. And you, you don't need to remain awake. You don't need to, to do anything except receive. Receive these healing vibrations. Receive the song. One woman, I recall, there's so many stories, and I have stories in the book as well. But one woman was newly on hospice, and when we showed up, the hospice nurse said, Oh, I'm so glad you're here. So and so, so and so um, hasn't stopped crying. Uh, so the other woman who came with me that day, uh, we began singing. And when you sing, you know, you don't jump from song to song. You can use a song almost as a calming mantra, just singing the same song, repeating it, and allowing. You can feel the whole vibration in the room, the environment change. Um, she began to stop crying for certain periods of time, and then she'd start, and then she'd stop again for longer and then she'd start and then she'd stop for longer until she stopped crying and she fell asleep and she hadn't been sleeping. We visited a gentleman and when we were ready to leave, he said, please don't go yet. Okay, so we sat there quietly and he said, I could feel the love. Wow. I could feel the love. Please come back. And I said to him, we will come back for as long as you're here. And that's what we want. That's what we want for each person to whom we sing. And it's not just it's not just the one in the bed. Family members are oh. consoled, you know? I mean, the vibrations go out. You, staff, staff uh, come to the door st and will stand there until... We, we finished, and I had one woman say as she was exiting the room, she said, well, that sure satisfied my soul. <laughs> and then she finally left. Because this um, impacts, life transition impacts everybody. Mm -hmm, yes. And obviously the one, you know, the, 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 the one who is making the transition obviously yes. is, is most impacted, but everybody around the, you know, the family, and even in the hospices, you, you, you while it takes a, um, you know, it's a special calling to work in a hospice. Mm -hmm. You still are, you, you, your human element still needs to be supported, and that's where this beauty of song comes in because. Mm -hmm everybody can get in touch with the meaning of the lyrics and the song and being present and being a compassionate companion. So that's what I'd like to do with this No One Without Song initiative is yes, there are places, geographic areas where there are many singers, there are many groups and there are other areas where which haven't been reached yet no one without song mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i want to be involved yeah 
That would be wonderful. Do you need a baritone? <laughs> well, of course, of course, the idea is to get so many other people involved in doing this. And for those who cannot carry a tune, and I have had two very good friends. <laughs> I'm real good who in the shower. To, who love I, I, to I, sing. And, and uh, this is years ago, one Sunday, I was standing next to, sitting, standing next to one of them in church. And I, my, Anyway, it was it was a challenge for me to be able to sing. Nevertheless, it doesn't matter. You can always bring singers in. You can use recorded music. Um, or if that person enjoys your voice anyway, you know. Everybody's it, ear is different. That's right. It doesn't matter how you how you. It, yeah, it, what you it's sing. about. It's about being present. It is. It is. Yeah. Oh, goodness, Linda, I could speak for you for like the rest of the day tomorrow and then the day after tomorrow about all this. But uh, oh goodness, and I, I have a sneaking suspicion we're going to do more. But now let, let all our listeners know how they can find your book, more information about your great work and how they can get involved. Sure. And thank you. No, no one without song. Right. Uh, the easiest way is to go to my website www.thecouragetocare.com uh, There you can find a direct link to the book or The Courage to Care, Being Fully Present with the Dying or ask for it at your local bookstore. You can ask me questions. I'll get back to you. You can grab a freebie uh, that I offer on how to ease and honor hmm, the one who is dying and make their death a bit more easier. Uh, yes, so I'd love, I would love to be your compassionate companion on however our journey unfolds together. Linda, thank you so much for spending the time with me today and for the great work that you're doing. And you certainly are someone who's creating healing ties. Thank you so much for this time today. Thank you and blessings. Whether it's an unexpected life-ending diagnosis, a loss of employment, or even the loss of the ability to go places and see people, the presence of another alongside us offers reassurance and confirmation of our values and membership in a circle of compassion, caring, and love. And through the great work of Reverend Linda, she is helping us Keep love in our hearts because love is music for the soul. And I'd like to thank you for joining us today for this episode of Healing Ties 2.0. And if you'd like to share your story on Healing Ties, email me direct at thebowtieguy at healingties.com. We would love to share your stories on Healing Ties. I'm your host and presenter, Christopher McClellan. I've created a life to love after caregiving ends by being with awesome people like you. And be sure to subscribe to Healing Ties wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. We'll see you for another episode of Healing Ties real soon. Take care. Bye for now.